This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan. This is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged today to have uh, two gentlemen that uh, I've had on podcasts previously, but not together, and it's great to bring them both together. First of all, I have Doug Cowan. Uh, I'll read his brief bio, and I'll let both of you, after I read these bios, if you want to supplement something here. Doug is Professor of Religious Studies and Social Development Studies at Renison University College at the University of Waterloo. For many years, he was a co-general editor of the premier journal of the New Religions, Nova Religio, and chair of the New Religious Movements Group of the American Academy of Religion. And then we have Joseph Laycock. Joe is an assistant professor of religious studies at Texas State University. He has written several books on new religious movements and American religious history. And he is also co-editor now of the journal Nova Religio. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, John. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add to your bios? Anything that stands out? Uh, no, I'm good. Let's just get into the discussion. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Well, today we're going to be talking about, uh, thank you for being willing to come on and talk about this. Uh, I keep running into, and I've I followed this for years, these uh, so-called ex-occultists. Uh, some may have had a prior background in that. Many, I think, are, are highly suspect. I remember years ago, Charisma Magazine picked up on a story of a gentleman who claimed to be the son of uh, illegitimate son of the late Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan, and uh, he was going into churches and making a lot of money with this claim. and And uh, I got in touch with him and really pressed the issue. And finally, uh, uh, it was demonstrated that it was fraudulent. And to their credit, Charisma ret- wrote a retraction story. But they continue to pick up these stories, whether at Charisma or other places, and. In Christian media. And so I think this is an important topic to talk about. Let's begin with the discussion of some of the, the history. Um, this isn't just a, a contemporary phenomenon. There, there have been, you know, claims about this going back at least to the med- medieval period. Is that correct? Who wants to yeah, start? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Ruben van Lugic, his, his book, uh, Children of Lucifer, uh, tries to find the first use of the word Satanist in in uh, English, and and this word appears around the time of the Protestant Reformation, right? The the, the wars of of religion, uh, and it it's a term that was used to kind of accuse your religious opponents of not just being the wrong kind of Christian, but of being something truly evil. And then when uh, the the doctrine, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, uh, becomes a point of debate you start getting these legends of black masses, right? Satanists are coming to steal uh, the, the transformed hosts to, to um, you know, to trample them and to curse them in black masses. And it's a little bit, uh, it reminds me of the, the Lucky Charms commercials, right? The Lucky Charms must be good because why would the leprechaun be perpetually trying to steal it? Or why would the kids be trying to, to, to steal it? Uh, so that's kind of the beginning of of these kinds of legends of of Satanism, and it seems like it was a long time before anyone actually stepped forward and said, "I actually am a Satanist. This is not just something I'm being falsely accused of." Yeah, and you, if you if you go you know, to take it in a slightly different direction, if you go earlier in the Protestant Reformation in terms of you know the occult, you get things like the Malleus Maleficarum, and you get the whole um, Roman Catholic concern. With, with Satanism, which became essentially a cottage industry for Roman Catholicism for, for much of the 13th and 14th century. Then it goes back even further than that. And this is where I think, you know, modern day sort of ex, you know, sort of the ex occultist narrative, the, the, the apostate, the, you know, the anecdotal apostate narrative gets a lot of more traction. The Bible, for example, doesn't say, you know, thou shalt not suffer a Buddhist to live, you know, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not suffer, you know, a a Scientologist to live. It says the Bible, you you shall not suffer a witch to live. So, in especially it not and not only in the West, but in uh, Africa, in Asia, in in all pretty much all over the world, 
we have this inside of humans. We have this deeply, deeply, deeply rooted fear of what we consider dark forces, whether they are Satanists, whether they are witches, whether they are a chupacabra, whether they, however they, however they manifest, it's deeply bred in our bones. And like no evangelist ever went broke, you know, beating the drum against the occult. Is, is this a manifestation of uh, the myth of the embodiment of, of evil kind of thing? I was surprised recently to see, I don't want to mention the name, not to embarrass an individual or single them out, a prominent progressive Christian who was trying to come to grips with tr the Trump phenomenon. And she said she came to the conclusion that he was demon possessed. That seems to be like the go-to kind of thing, right? If someone is beyond the pale in your understanding of, of evil, they must be the embodiment of evil, whether that's satanic or what have you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just speak to them and then let Joe, because, because I, I, I admit that I've become, as a Canadian, I've become unhealthily obsessed with what's going on in your country. <laughs> um, but the, I mean, Joe knows this, that the, the idea of, of being demon possessed is kind of like an all purpose slur that you can apply to pretty much anybody who doesn't fit with your particular um, way of looking at the world. And the important thing about that, and I think this is really important for the X member narrative, the I used to be a Satanist, I used to be a witch, and now I'm a happy, healthy Christian kind of narrative, is those narratives and the idea of well, he must be demon possessed, or they must be demon possessed. That is, it's not meant to convince anybody who is not already convinced of that. I mean, the way you set up that question kind of points to that reality. When somebody goes in and says, "Well, they must be demon possessed," I mean, I, I remember going to Bob Larson's, you know, first public exorcism in Calgary, Alberta, and you know, he was not speaking to me there, right? He was not trying to convince me. He was speaking to people who were already convinced of the reality of the thing. So he's basically doing reality. You know what Peter Berger and Thomas Luckmann would call he's doing reality maintenance for them. He's like, it, it, it's all about saying you have the correct worldview if you think this way. Does that make sense the way I put it? Yeah. Yeah, Dave, David Frankfurter wrote a book called Evil Incarnate, and he notes that the same kind of stories appear over and over again. Yeah. In fact, if you look at what uh, some pagans had to say about the early Christians, it was they murder babies and they have weird orgies, right? And that's that's the claim over and over again, right? They do all these other bad things, but the main thing is they eat babies and they have weird uh, uh, sex orgies. And, and he suggests that human beings are probably kind of hardwired to tell these kinds of stories, uh, as a form of reality maintenance, right? As we must be, the, the way things are must be the way they ought to be because look how monstrous our opponents are. Look how these people are who who do everything uh, uh, backwards. And Frankfurter has said that, that evil with a capital E is basically intellectual laziness. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to think about, you know, why someone like Trump does the things they do or the, all the complicated ways in which this is harmful. I just want to say they're, they're demon possessed and, and move on uh, uh, with my day. And here in San Marcos, someone from the Satanic Temple gave a prayer invocation at the city council, uh, which resulted in um, a busload of Catholic protesters coming down from Pennsylvania and all sorts of things. And in the parking lot, someone confronted him and said, can I, can I pray for you? And he just sort of waved and said, do whatever you got to do, man, and, and headed towards his car. And then he just started doing an exorcism, right? Sort of a shouting exorcism as this guy was getting into his car. And afterwards, I asked him, did you, did you really think that that man was possessed by demons? And he says, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I said, how can you tell? Do you have a, a gift of discernment? Can you see spirits? And he just said, no, I, but anybody who would do that, anybody that would give a prayer invocation uh, uh, saying, hail Satan, is obviously possessed by, by, by demons. Uh, so to, you know, to, to Doug's point, there was no, um, no kind of discussion, right? You either just accept my premise is true uh, or you don't. Yeah, and the great thing about that is it's totally non-falsifiable at that point. So that so that the people who are willing, who are already predisposed to believe that, just latch on to it. I mean, it bifurcates the discussion. You know, 
anybody who's already predisposed to to believe that is already there. And anybody who's not predisposed to believe it is not going to be convinced. Well, within the, the academic study of new religious movements, there's this uh, type of literature that talks about apostate testimonies or ex-member testimonies. And of course, there are within Christianity, there are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and Latter-day Saints and so on. And uh, Ex-Sadducees. <laughs> yes, or current Sadducees, depending on how you look at it, or Pharisees anyway. And they they go on and they, they speak with expertise in churches and so on. Can you put the uh, the alleged ex occultist in that context and why it appears to be even more popular and carry more weight uh, emotionally for for Christians? Yeah, I I would totally do that. In fact, I in in the book that I was talking about earlier, this little Christian countercult thing that's coming out from from Cambridge, I actually talk about apostate testimony testimony and the ex-member ten. I think I talk about ex-occultists at that point. I might even mention Warren Key and Schnobel and, 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 and people like that. But it, it invokes a couple of things. One is it invokes the um the sort of the non-falsifiability of I was there and you weren't. Right? I was there and you weren't. So how do you know you can, nobody's going to look up and say, hey, I, you know what, excuse me, I just I need some clarification. Are you really saying this? Well, I was there and you weren't. That's one. The, the second thing is it the idea of ex-member testimony goes right again. I, I make a joke, but it goes right back to Paul. Because I mean, Paul is saying, not the alien, the saint. Paul is saying, um, you know, I used to do these things. I used to be the one running around doing these things, and then I met Jesus and everything's better. And then you think about Augustine. Augustine became sort of the arch critic of groups, especially of a group, the, the Montanists, of which he was actually a part. Right. So he was, you know, I used to be this and now I'm that. You find this um all throughout religious history. And I imagine, you know what? I imagine if you looked at other religions, you'd you'd find the same thing. It becomes a cottage industry in the United States with this sort of anti-Catholic nativism. And in the 19th century, you could, you could, you could, you know, I think you could take the word occult as you're framing it now, John. And in the 19th century, you could replace it with Catholic and you'd get virtually the same kind of a way of responding to what is result what is re regarded as a social problem and it's the same thing like did the, the the maria monk you know the the famous you know the the uh the awful disclosures of maria monk um it's totally fictitious it was totally made up and yet it's still in print it's still kept in print for example by fundamentalist by Protestant Christians of the anti-Catholic bent. So it's that same kind of um, look how terrible things were where I was and look how great things are now that I've come over to where all you are that I'm speaking with. Do you have anything to add to that, Joe? Yeah, Richard Hofstetter talks about this in his famous essay, The Paranoid Style. Uh, but he writes, uh, a special significance attaches to the figure of the renegade from the enemy cause. And then he uses all these examples of I was a Freemason, I was a Catholic, uh, and, and so on. And he says, uh, in some parts, the special authority accorded the renegade derives from the obsession with the secrecy so characteristic of such movements, right? And this is especially true when we're talking about not just, you know, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness, but I used to be a member of some secret satanic cult that that you know murders thousands of babies or, or something like this where people might say this there's no such thing it, it doesn't exist and he says there's also an eschatological significance to this that these narratives imply uh, uh the good guys always win right yeah. uh even if no one seems to be buying what we're selling uh, people like this are, are buying it right and so in the end we're gonna we're gonna flip all the bad guys and, uh, and the millennium will still come as promised yeah, I, I mean, there's that whole genre of Christian literature, only the worst of which is the Left Behind series, which is which is pretty much based. It tells exactly the same story, but it's the kind of story you always know how it's going to win in the uh, 
Christians are going to win in the end and everything's going to be okay. And it's filled with sort of all of these novels are filled with this ex, kind of ex-member testimony that you're talking about gradually as those who um, are left behind gradually figure out the truth and they convert and then use their story then to convert others. Let's talk about some of the, the personalities, the figures, uh, one from the past, Mike Warnke, uh, famously claimed to be a witch and a Satanist high priest. And uh, he was exposed, interestingly enough, by a couple of evangelicals uh, in the book, uh, you, you know, his Warnke's book, the, the Satan, Satan Seller, they came out, you know, with a book and exposed that. I, I followed up. I hadn't thought about Warnke for years and just Googled him. I thought uh, my assumption was that after he was exposed, uh, he kind of would have just disappeared, but he's still out there. He's still lingering. And apparently, uh, he never really completely repudiated, even after the, the the expose. He says he embellished, but he wasn't making it up out of whole cloth. And now he's got a book out talking about how you can forgive Christians who treat you unfairly. Uh, I'm assuming he's referring to the folks who don't believe his story in the expose. So that was Mike Warnke in the past, but there are many other figures. Uh, let's talk about some of those. I know, Joe, you had, had some that you mentioned in your book on uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I mean, Warnke is, is kind of key because the Satanic Panic in 1972, when that book came out, is still kind of in its infancy, right? Um, when, when Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan in the 1960s, Satanism was was still kind of cute, right? And and it was kind of this goofy kind of sideshow thing, and people were not sort of responding to it with, with horror. Uh, and then you had the Manson murders. Uh, and I, uh, 1971, the John Birch Society is one of the first people to put out, you know, we've connected all these things, Rosemary's Baby and Charles Manson and Anton LaVey. It's all of a piece and says, other than communism, this is the biggest threat to America, <laughs> right, is, is the Satanists. And a year later, you get uh, uh, Mike Borky. And the book is, you know, patently ridiculous. He's talking about leading a group of 5,000 people uh, that conducts, you know, murders and human sacrifice on a regular basis. And then he uh, he sort of disappoints the group, and so his uh, his female sex slaves sort of try to kill him with a with a drug overdose. So there's almost this kind of Scarface esque uh, a fantasy, and then he goes and and, and joins the the navy and, and finds Jesus. Uh, what Cornerstone magazine reported well, they, well, first of all, they could find you know pictures of him in his college yearbook doing Campus Crusade for Christ or something when he was supposedly leading this this satanic uh, uh, group. And they, they think that um, ministers that he met in the Navy kind of had this idea to write a book about the dangers of youth being seduced by the occult. And he kind of took that idea and, and ran with it and eventually operated a, something called the Witchmobile, which was sort of a trailer full of witch artifacts that you could, I guess, pay a dime or something and, and, and go look at. Uh, and, and so he was kind of one of the first people to just uh, uh, tell these kinds of outrageous stories. And then in Dungeons and Dragons, in my research on claims about that game, you have this fellow named uh, William Schnobelin, who really tops Warnke and claiming that he, yes, I was a satanic priest, but I was also uh, a, a Wiccan high priest. I was a Catholic bishop. I was a Mormon bishop. Uh, and I was a literal vampire. I literally sustained myself on human blood and would burn in the sunlight. Uh, so I know about all these groups because I've somehow been uh, a, a member of, of all of them and I helped design Dungeons and Dragons so that's how I know that it's a satanic game because I was personally consulted to make sure that all the evil in the game uh, uh, was accurate and, and, and up to date so uh, uh, Schnobelin is kind of one of the more baffling uh, uh, figures just because of the sheer outrageousness of his claims but he's still he's you know he, the, what Schnobelin and Warnke what they demonstrate to me is, is again, it goes back, for me at least, my little way of thinking about it, it goes back to it doesn't really matter what people are being told as long as it confirms the worldview that they hold because the alternative is simply too terrifying. And what I mean by that is not that there are witches and, and, and wiccans and druids and pagans out there. It's not what I mean. By too terrifying, I mean... Christianity, like many other religions, 
makes exclusively bedrock claims about reality. The way I perceive reality is the way reality is. So I describe it uh, for classes, for example. I use a Jenga tower. You know that that game, Jenga? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I said, look, imagine a Jenga tower and somebody pulls out one of the bottom ones and the thing starts to shake. And you, maybe that bottom one is... Well, maybe there are things in the Bible that really aren't true. The tower starts to shake a little bit. And you say, well, maybe this isn't true. And the tower starts to shake some more. And the thing is, if that's why people like this never disappear, because they can continually reinvent because they're leaning into the idea that the alternative, having to put away dispense with the entirety of one's worldview for example you know i'm a member of the clergy project you may have you may have you heard of that it's the ex-clergy um but and i'm i'm free and easy i mean i have another career i have another job everybody i know um knows i'm an atheist and those who don't know i don't care about uh but i know people whose entire world would fall apart family employment pension if their beliefs were known so when whenever somebody like schnobelin or or warnke or you think about any other evangelist who has think about any other evangelist who've been caught in some kind of scandal they've lied they've done this and they've cried the crocodile tears and said the words they tend not to disappear. Be and it, for me at least, it it speaks so much to the fear that lies at the heart of reality maintenance. What happens if things are not the way we think they are? Well, Warnke and Schnoblin are something of uh, they're from prior decades. They're still around, but they're not really doing much, as far as I can tell. You've got contemporary figures like uh, I don't know if you. I've run across John Ramirez. Uh, he's all over uh, Christian media. He claims to be, his most prominent claim is ex-Satanist, uh, but he also at times promotes himself as an ex-witch. If you track down his bio on his website, he's a former practitioner of Santeria in Florida, uh, which raises some interesting questions. There seems to be, in, in terms of how they understand themselves, kind of this dualism. If you were involved in, Anything that's equated with the dark arts, then you're a former Satanist. Uh, any thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, I think I, I think Warnke is just completely making stuff up out of whole cloth. I think Schnobelin had a genuine fascination with some of these these groups from some of the things that that he says. Um, this book by Schnobelin, uh, Lucifer Dethrones. It's blurring his face out. I don't know what that means. There we go. <laughs> um, he he has a, a a document in there, a copy of the document signed by Anton LaVey, acknowledging someone named Christopher P. Sin uh, as a second grade member of the Church of Satan. And he says, I, that was my name when I was a Satanist. It could be true. It could be, this is someone else's document. It could be a complete forgery. But But I think he was sort of legitimately interested in those things. And then with Ramirez, he definitely was a practitioner of, of Santeria and other Afro-Cuban religions. When he says things like, my mother was Yamaya and my father was Shango, that sounds pretty authentic. But what he's doing is a kind of uh, a category confusion, right? Because he's saying um, Santeria is actually Satanism. And therefore, because I know about Santeria, I know about everything else that can be labeled as, as Satanism. Uh, including atheistic groups that began in Boston, which historically have absolutely nothing to do uh, uh, with something like like Santeria. Um, so there's actually kind of an interesting variety of, of of strategies with how these claims kind of get generated. And they, I mean, they they get lumped together because the, the worldview for which they are providing maintenance, reality maintenance, is essentially a very Manichaean one. It's either light or it's dark. And you, you, there's, there, there's the body of the saved, and there's everybody else who, is, who are all in, enthralled to Satan, regardless of the particular path they took to get there. And 
you know, that I think is another one of the little the little Jenga tower pieces. If you start picking at the threads of your worldview, it's going to come crashing down. I mean, the other thing about, and this kind of gets more into my current wheelhouse, which is how do you know what you know, right? And, you know, we're all pop culture nerds, like deep, deep nerds. We're all pop culture nerds. I When I'm teaching, and I don't know, Joe, if you found this as well, but the amount of knowledge the amount of information that my students have about any religion other than the very narrow slice in which they've been raised they got through pop culture full stop right so anything they think they know about satanism or witchcraft or the occult came through whatever package of movies netflix managed to secure on contract for the next three or four months. And, you know, we have this little thing on our brain. It's, it's a survival mechanism for, for humans that it's called source dissociation. And what it means is that we tend to forget where we learn something, especially if it agrees with something we already know or already think we know. So if we are already predisposed, if we go to a Catholic church, for example, and you know a, a priest says something is like, don't, don't do Ouija, don't do tarot, don't get involved in the occult, um, right? And you know, we see something on Netflix and it and it and it reinforces that. We tend to forget that it was a movie that we watched over time. So all of these things, like Joe's exactly right, this idea that Satanism and witchcraft and, and Santeria and, and all of these things. I was just watching um, a, a show and the, um, the, uh, it's a, about a narco, it's about a narco group. And they have uh, a statue of the Virgin Mary uh, with, with a machine gun belt around her. And they kind of, you know, they kind of, uh, Santa Muerte. Right. And but so all of that gets conflated into the bucket that is called Satanism. And the idea of the occult gets layered on top of that because occult, of course, means hidden or, or unseen or available only to those who are taken in as initiates. We're all of a sudden right back to the, well, I was there and you weren't because I was an initiate. And how are you going to question what I'm bringing to you? This relates to a, a book that you're co-authoring, if I remember correctly, Joe. Uh, aren't you looking at how the ideas about the demonic and so on are, are really informed quite a bit by horror movies and pop culture? Yeah, that book is called The Exorcist Effect, and uh, Doug wrote me a really nice uh, a blurb for it, so that should be coming out uh, later this year. Uh, and we do have cognitive science uh, doing studies on movies, right, and showing that um for example they call it the mirroring effect but if you see something in a movie you'll you'll make the same gesture back children do this more than adults but adults do it too uh and definitely that information that we see in a movie is much more likely to be retained uh, and much more likely to be misremembered as a memory of something that actually happens right because if you're that's the source dissociation if, if you're ra if you're sort of racking your brain for information and what your brain is giving you is text you say, well, I must have read that somewhere. I don't remember where, but I read it. But if what you get is images and sounds, did you see that on TV? Did that really happen to you? Was it a dream? It, it could take you some time uh, uh, to sort that out. Uh, and so this book kind of explores um, the, uh, the cycle of kind of movies inspiring actual events and then events becoming the basis for, for movies. Uh, and there's a chapter on Malachi Martin, who is also mm -hmm. one of these figures who is kind of making stuff up uh, and and then Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were sometimes mm -hmm. making stuff up, sometimes just sort of um, kind of throwing spaghetti on the wall, <laughs> right, <laughs> and just sort of seeing what, what what comes out of it. But one thing I found out about them was that they too uh, had a very early interest in in witchcraft, uh, in the same way that I think William Schnobelin uh, uh, did. Uh, so with some of these figures, in addition to everything else that's going on, I think there's a real desire for a magical universe to be real, right? And if they can't make that happen through um, kind of 
more mainstream Christianity or they can't they can't sort of make themselves fit in in something like Santeria or or Wicca. They can have this really great enchanted universe through living in this kind of mythological world of hidden cults and defectors <laughs> and kind of everything building up in this epic supernatural battle leading to the to the millennium. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, think about Ed and Lorraine Warren. I that's kind of being recycled right now by James Wan. You know, in the Conjuring series, and it's again, it goes. You hit the for me at least, you hit the nail right on the head, Joe, when you said, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, absent other information, absent other knowledge about a particular topic, when we're asked a question, you know, what do you know about? I use Scientology as an example all the time for this is, you know, your brain is going to, whatever is most available is what's going to fill that in. And if what's most available is the South Park episode on Scientology, that's what's going to fill in your brain. It's a process called the availability heuristic. And the same is true with the occult. Again, we go back to this idea of, you know, ex occultist speaking to appreciative Christian audiences the Christian audiences are already primed to hear these things, right? So, and and every, I mean, this is why, for me at least, I think this is why, I okay, here's my confession. Will you hear my confession? I'm a huge Charmed fan. The original series. I mean, I just delighted in that from beginning. It was super hokey. I get it. But I, I sort of delighted in that. Because it was one of the very first series that actually started presenting modern pag, some version of modern paganism in a way that wasn't sort of hammer films, right? That and and if you think about the very first episode of Charmed, one of Piper, the middle daughter, she's in in conversation with this priest. And the, she's and, and she thinks she's a witch, and the priest says, "Well, you know, we burn witches. Maybe not now, but you know, maybe we should." I'm paraphrasing, but then at the very end of that episode, she kind of steps into a church and steps out, and nothing happens to her. And she steps into a church and steps out, and nothing happens to her. And she realizes, "I'm good." And it was one of the first times that the idea of the occult was presented in this way. And what did you see after that with Sabrina and Buffy and, and all the rest of it? You saw this huge uptick in interest in, um, in, in, in Wicca and witchcraft and the occult, which if you look at what happened to that interest through the CUNY surveys after those went off the air, completely tailed off. So it's a there is a pop culture effect to this that feeds into what Joe is talking about and what uh, you know Harry Potter even right. Can you speak so. to how these uh, ex occult narratives play into Christians doing their identity work, particularly in this cultural moment? It's interesting to me that if you look at the satanic panics and satanic concerns in Christian circles in the past, you know, 1970s into the 1980s, it's it's usually pop culture, concerned about music and gaming and these kinds of things. But as we move forward, uh, it's increasingly not only pop culture and the religious other, but it's quite a bit now in the political sphere where the other is is literally demonized and under, under the control of, of satanic forces. So how do, how do do these concepts and these personalities play into Christians in this context in terms of their sense of identity reinforcement construction and this type of thing? I mean, I, I think that these things are always um, conservative, right? They're always, and, and by what I mean by that is there have been recent changes in the culture, and they're trying to sort of push back uh, against them. So I think one thing that helped fuel the the satanic panic in the early 70s and books like mike warnke was the kind of hangover from the counterculture of the 1960s and a desire to kind of uh return to order right one of these catholic groups that goes and, and protests the satanic temple is even called that return to, to to order so i think that's one part of it i do think that we're increasingly seeing 
politicians who think that they can kind of manipulate a, a, a satanic panic uh, to help their their aim. So I watched this uh, a news piece from the, the local Bronx News about John Ramirez, and he he's not a super articulate guy, at least not in, in English, right? Uh, he kind of struggles to, to get his ideas out. Um, and then at the end, uh, they interview this pastor. Uh, her name is Pura uh, M. de Jesus uh, Canigilio. Uh, I uh, apologize for butchering her name. Much more well-spoken, right? Uh, much, much more uh, uh, articulate in front of the camera. She's a pastor. She also ran for Congress and tried to take uh, AOC's uh, a seat. So when I see those two people together, I can't help but think, did someone see your narrative of, you know, the kind of Santeria that's practiced by some Puerto Rican families is satanic uh, and think this is it, right? This this could be weaponized. This could be uh, useful. This has even shown up in the current conflict in Ukraine, uh, where one of the things that's being said to justify the war is Ukraine is run by Satanists. And we have to go in and we have to eliminate all of the, the Satanists and kind of speculation about this. Uh, claim is, well, this might be kind of selling the war to, to Russians, but this is also selling the, the war to Americans, right? Because a lot of Americans are into these sort of claims. And if they were to get someone like Trump back in the White House, that could be used to cut off resources to Ukraine and help Russia uh, uh, you know, win, win, win the war. So I do think we need to pay attention to the way that uh, these kinds of narratives are being uh, uh, used politically because I think people have gotten a lot more clever and deliberate uh, than in previous decades on kind of playing the, the satanic panic card. Yeah, I agree. I think I, I'd put it even a little bit more bluntly than that is is I think a lot of it is entirely transactional. It's in, in, especially in a politi- in the politi- current political sphere. It's entirely transactional. I mean, you know, you have somebody like, you know, the the sort of you've mentioned AOC, but the the anti AOC is 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 uh, MJT, right? A woman with such a transactional relationship to the truth that every time she opens her mouth, it's the functional equivalent of lying, and um, and the idea, whatever ha- you could never go to um, a meeting, let us say, Joe. John, you and I are at the American Academy of Religion, for, for example, and and somebody comes into our session that we're having and starts pounding the table about Ukraine and Satanists. That's 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 not that's not a dog that's gonna hunt, you know, in that particular forest. So the idea of, of transaction is if it takes Satanists to get us on side for this, that's what it's going to be. If it takes witches to get us on side, if it takes Hillary Clinton to get us on side, if it takes the email server to get us on side, if it takes, um, you know, babies, you know, whatever the whatever the Jewish space lasers to get us on side. Right. It's so and the and I see the same thing with a lot of the ex member testimony. It's entirely transactional. Um, this is not to say that that at least in some cases they don't believe it, although I think, you know, Warren Key, I think, was a knowing fraud. You know, there's there's a, there's a there's um, there are people who are sincerely deluded about their own experience or interpret their experience in a certain way, and then there are simple bullshit artists, and 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 Warnke is just a bullshit artist, and 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 knowing one, I mean, because there's also the whole thing about his his supposed experience as a medic in Vietnam, right? He joined the Navy because he thought he'd be safe on boats. And then he realized that the Marine Corps uses Navy hospital corpsmen, so he found he wound up in the jungle. So, but in terms of the other side of that equation, the audience, the the audience that's hearing this, it doesn't matter because it's reinforcing a worldview that it is just too terrifying for them to let go. For me, this explains a lot of what's going on in the mega movement. It's just too terrifying to let go. You know, people have been saying ahead of this, you know, ahead of the arraignment this afternoon, you know, what's it going to take for MAGA people to to just like dump Trump? I said, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to happen. 
Yeah, unfortunately, we'll we'll keep an eye on that and see what yeah. happens. But uh, uh, Joe, before we started recording, you said you wanted to, to touch on uh, there. I first saw this claim in, a, I think he's a Christian evangelist and musician uh, that uh, at uh, the recent uh, Satan Con by the Satanic Temple that I think it was 90 or 100 uh, conversions had allegedly happened. And that seems to be a part of this broader context for this ex-occultist narrative that, yeah, they may be out there, but look, we can win them over too. So we're on the right side. Can you touch bases on that? Yeah. So Satan Con uh, was held recently in, in Boston. Uh, I didn't attend, but I understand about 800 uh, uh, people did. I spoke to, to some of them. And in the immediate uh, aftermath of this, there was this claim uh, made on Twitter, uh, someone named uh, Sean Fucht, maybe the first person to yes, to yeah. make this claim, but it it made the rounds on Twitter and eventually ended up on Fox News. And he said, "Well, a hundred Satanists, so that would be about one in eight, right, uh, converted to Christianity uh, uh, on the spot, right? So so you had your big rally Satanists, but really you lost. Uh, uh, you know, we we win." And the response uh, uh, from Satanists on Twitter was, well, who are these people, right? Give us one name. Name one Satanist who converted to, to Christianity. And they also asked, are you aware, because they said, we infiltrated your conference. They said, are you aware of the security measures at the conference? They didn't answer that. What they were referring to was, uh, there is apparently a big sign when you walked in. It said, if you walk past this line, God will see you. And God knows that by walking past <laughs> this line deliberately, you are pledging your soul to Satan and turning your back on Jesus. Right? Uh, nobody making these rumors seemed to be aware of that sign or had a thought about, you know, God understands what I'm doing or anything like that. Uh, so, so this is a completely fake uh, a rumor. But I would watch on Twitter, the Satanists would make these objections. If your story isn't true, you have no evidence. And the replies from Christians were all basically like, ha ha, Satanists, right? God wins every time. Uh, not even engaging with this question of of evidence, but simply celebrating, right? The story itself is good enough to to celebrate and 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 gloat over. Um, so I do think this this demonstrates the kind of belief persistence, right? That that Doug is describing here. Yeah, and, and it's it, and the and anytime you have that kind of belief persistence, which is a nice term, I like it very much. Um, it's going to reinforce identity. And it's the identity of being of, of of being right, being correct, being um, on the on the you know the correct side of the spiritual line, and uh, conversions are the you know you think about I don't I don't know if you remember John remember the the cross and the switchblade oh yes yeah the the book the cross and the switchblade and and um, Wilkerson right. Yeah, David Wilkerson. Yeah. That whole, I mean, that whole kind of late 50s, early 60s, um, dealing with the gangs in New York, which were the Satanism of the day, right? Dealing with the gangs in New York was filled with these kind of um, almost ecstatic uh, uh, descriptions of so many people were saved and so many people were. And then you've got the, you know, the, the, the idea it was the guy it's been so long since I've actually done this kind of stuff with all the <laughs> names and I'm old and the guys, the names are going away. I was at a John Hagee. I was at a John Hagee, uh, a rally in Calgary. And I was I was at his crusade one night, and he was talking about uh, the United Society of the United Association of Satanists, and he was telling this story about how the United Association of Satanists had sent uh, someone to assassinate him at a uh, at a crusade, and I and he was preaching, and he was you know uh, was kind of a bowling ball shaped guy, and and he was he he, he had this great big bible and he was saying and i i saw this united satanist the united satanists of america that's what it was the united satanists of america had come to uh had come to to assassinate him and he said and they fired their gun and three bullets went to the right of me and three bullets went to the left of me and then he goes on to tell how many people were saved at the end of that i mean it's a it's a completely made up story I mean, I mean, 
it's completely made up. But I watched as all kinds of people kind of stream down because their identity, their 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 sense of being on the right side of spiritual history is reinforced every time one of those stories are told. And it's it's the fascinating thing about religious faith, it seems to me. Yeah, we're talking about the cross and the switchblade. You know, another great uh, uh, bullshit artist was John Todd, uh, yeah. <laughs> who who uh, is actually in the uh, Jack Chick track Dark Dungeons about Dungeons and Dragons. There's a pastor there with a handlebar mustache. It's supposed to be John Todd. But speaking of pop culture, he said, I saw the movie The Cross and the Switchblade. And that's what made me, you know, renounce uh, uh, witchcraft because he claimed he was raised in, in witchcraft uh, and then be, become a Christian. Uh, and his whole ministry was was basically taking things he had seen in movies and television and uh, and presenting it as this is real, and if you give me money, I can help to get more witches out of Christianity. And and somebody even said your family history sounds a lot like the soap opera Dark Shadows. <laughs> are you just are you just repeating Dark Shadows to us? And he said, well, the thing is, my family's diary was stolen by executives in Hollywood, so Dark Shadows ripped off my story. It's it's, it's the other way around. I love that. That I hadn't heard that story. Well, it's just interesting how this stuff pops up all over the place. There's a really prominent uh, pastor. He's got this huge tent church. Is it Locke? Is that his uh, last name? And he, he is always on social media. And he came out within the last few months, I think it was, and said he didn't name anybody, but he said, there are three witches in this congregation, and I know about you, and uh, you know uh, we're going to cast you out and this type of thing. So just there's this reservoir within Christianity that we go to on the witches and the Satanists, and it just functions uh, in, in so many ways. A any final thoughts that you might yeah. have on the subject? Anything I'm missing? Well, well, in terms of the, I mean, when you said, you know, I know there are three witches. You know, it's, it reminds me of that opening scene of the Paper Chase. You know, look to the left, look to the right. You know, two of you won't be here at the end of the first year. When I was writing, um, I don't know if it was America's Dark Theologian or The Forbidden Body, but um, I, I came across a story, and we were using it, of a woman in Missouri, and this is just a couple of three years ago, right? In Missouri, in small town of Missouri, it goes into the library, and she's discovered that she has through one, two, three, and me, or something like that. She's discovered that she has some um, indigenous past, some indigenous uh, genetics. So she wants to 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 um, uh, research that. She goes to the public computer, the library. And she's looking up indigenous spirituality, and it leads to sort of Wiccan and pagan, and and she all of a sudden she can't get to the websites. The filter software at the library has blocked her, and she goes to the librarian and she says, uh, "This has happened." And she says, "Oh, that's so that people can't access those kinds of sites, and I have to report those people who do." This is like four or five years ago, and then the ACLU took the case on, and. You know, I think it ran for about three years, but this kind of this goes right back to what Joe and I were saying at the very beginning is that this Christian because Christianity has this deep, deep well of distrust that names the witch, that names Satan, that names people who serve those forces and humanity writ large has this extraordinarily bred in the bone fear of dark forces. That it's it it's like I said, nobody ever, no evangelist ever went broke going to that particular well. Anything to add there, Joe? Man, I, I don't want to end this on a depressing note. <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, I I think that this is, I mean, on, on the one hand, people like Mike Warnke are are funny, right? Because it's like you're so full of crap, right? I mean, this is this is kind of hilarious. I mean, and this is quite serious, right? I mean, this story shows how these kinds of beliefs are affecting our politics. They're affecting the, the laws we make. Uh, they're really harming people. And these ideas seem so entrenched and so hardwired 
I'm not really sure what is a good solution to help kind of take some of the energy out of them. So um, I don't want to end on a on a depressing note, uh, but I, I am very disturbed <laughs> if I think well, about this for too long. Well, I, I, can I try? Please. Shot. Okay, let, let me try. I mean, the, the fact that, John, you invited Joe and I even to talk about this is is a big deal for example i mean joe and i are both you know professional academics working in the academy and joe knows from being part of nova religio and so do i and john you've been involved for a long time 20 years ago the kind of research that we do would not really be approved of by the powers that be at many 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 universities now you know, I'm at a stage of my career where I can just say, screw you, I'll, you know, I'll write what I want. But, you know, when I look at younger scholars like Joe, I go, bravo to you for stepping up and doing this. And I think the environment, the intellectual environment is now such that there's no price to be paid, if, if, if that makes sense. There's no price to be paid for researching these things. So now when Joe does his work on the Exorcist or, or Dungeons and Dragons, it's fully fledged scholarship that is in, in, in yeah, not everywhere, but in, in maybe it's taken seriously. And I think that's a good sign. Well, I appreciate the attempt at uh, ending on a positive note. I, I, unfortunately, I think this podcast will go down as yet another program that is probably less well received by my primary audience than uh, others who follow my page in the Satanic Temple and other religious traditions. But uh, I, I hope that uh, those who can hear it uh, will hear it because, uh, like uh, Joe was saying, I think this is this just has ramifications in a whole lot of areas. Uh, legal, political, religious freedom issues. I mean, Christians are using this to stifle the religious freedom expression of others. So uh, I want to thank both of you for the work that you do and uh, over the years and your willingness to come on and share your expertise and your perspectives here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Again, this is the podcast for Multifaith Matters. Thanks for watching and listening. Look in the program notes for uh, links to these gentlemen's uh, websites and their work and some related resources that we have talked about today during the course of the program.